Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Marvel That Meets the Eye continues with the latter half of this four-issue miniseries. We left off on issue 40. So let's get you all caught up on what happened last week. Take control of the noble office pots as they wage slave their secret war against the evil execucons. Office bots, transform and clock in. Actually, let's take a moment to talk about a few things from last time that I didn't really dive into. With the continual shifting focus of new characters, you might be inclined to kind of think of it like say, Rob Liefeld's Youngblood output of the like. The thing is, though, that Buddy Ansky, despite being weighed down by Hasbro continually telling him, promote this new toy every month, knew how to craft stories with them. Because of the nature of this retrospective, I can't fully deep dive into each issue without the retrospective ballooning beyond its already lengthy time, but we've still got individual issues telling stories. The return of Cybertron two-parter last time, where we met Blaster, it's excellent, in particular the smelting pool and its tragedy of an Autobot who wanted to be respected by his peers, but kept screwing up. Blaster still believed in him, but he tragically died while giving him the info they needed. I felt more emotion and sympathy for this one-off character in the book than I've ever felt for anything Rob Liefeld did with Youngblood. Hell, the dude didn't even get a toy until 2016. Which, admittedly, was just a redeco of the UFO Transformer I've brought up a few times. Poor guy still doesn't get respect. My point is, the comics kept doing that. Those five Autobots Optimus based on copies of memories of ones he knew back on Cybertron? That was the rock concert issue, which was just really more of a fun comedy, even though the individual Transformers didn't stand out. But they didn't have to to still get the ideas across. Omega Supreme gets introduced, and while the focus of the issue is on the Autobot attack to get info on the Combiner tech, we get to see how cool and badass he is by taking down six Decepticons on his own. I am the guardian of the gates, the junction of your destruction, the laser lighting the way to your doom, the planner of your obsolescence, the furnace that fires your demise. I am the number you cannot compute, Decepticon. I am the square root of negative one. But that number cannot exist! You lack imagination, Decepticon. Skids' desire to break away from the war, run about in Runamuck painting lame graffiti while advancing Circuit Breaker story arc, the Predacons being summoned to covertly assassinate Megatron. The book may not follow a central cast for its long run in each issue, but you feel satisfied reading these stories because they're told so competently and advance the ideas of the franchise. That's the thing about toyetic shows and franchises. The problem is never that they're trying to sell toys, it's that often they're not being clever enough in how they sell the toys. Sound Soundwave might be my favorite, but damn if I don't want a Skids or a Fortress Maximus toy now because I liked how things have been presented in the comic. So yeah, despite the ever-changing character focus, despite the coloring and model errors, high purple Soundwave and toy versions of Ratchet and others because the artists didn't have the final versions to base you on, despite the lack of some of the familiar staples, this comic has been a fun space opera in the same vein as Rom, just not focused on a single character. Oh yeah, those lack of familiar staples. For instance, Optimus has been presumed dead and absent for 16 issues. Megatron's been gone for 15, and I didn't mention it because the battle was so quick, but but Starscream has been gone since the attack that Omega Supreme foiled. Kind of presumed dead, but we'll later learn that their bodies are deactivated and held in the Ark. Sure, it sucks that so many of them have been sidelined, but at the same time, it's allowing more focus on characters like Soundwave, Ratbat, Blaster, Grimlock, and others to get more time and seeing how they operate without the mainstays around. But a lot of these characters are indeed returning, and we've still got plenty of new faces to say hello to as well. Let's dig into the Transformers number 41 to 80 and see what sort of twists are coming our way in the latter half of the Marvel series.
We begin issue 41 with Optimus Prime exploding. Again. I mean, this was at one point connected to the larger Marvel Universe. You've just got to expect some characters to die and then come back to life and then die again multiple times. What's actually happening here is that they're trying to restore Prime's body now that they've got the floppy disk that contains his brain. Unfortunately, the Headmasters have used up all their resources in rebuilding Goldbug and the Pretenders, so unfortunately they're incapable of constructing a new body for him that'll remain stable. They detect the Ark nearby and figure they'll have resources to help in the process. Grimlock, however, is being his tyrannical self, refusing to care about the Decepticons they left on Earth. But hey, at least this answered what happens to his crown when it transforms. It stays on his dinosaur head. Neat. They meet up, but Grimlock is none too happy with the news they bring. Autobots bonded with humans, Goldbug being with them, plus Optimus Prime's brain. Goldbug surrenders himself for the sake of unity, but Grimlock wants to wage battle with Fortress Maximus using an old archaic single combat tradition for leadership of the Autobots. Now, now Grimlock, you can't challenge him like this. You've got to send two annoying minions out to write graffiti everywhere and then forget you wanted to make the challenge. Goldbug convinces Blaster to fight in place of Fortress Maximus, since Fort Max is still recovering from battle two issues ago. Unfortunately, the Decepticons, still in the rocket island they blasted into space, track Fort Max's ship to the Ark, and thus plan on making an attack. Blaster and Grimlock's battle takes place on the moon, and it's a damn good fight. Most of the Autobots standing around and watching. But then the Decepticons launch their sneak attack. Most of it is actually a distraction. The Constructicons focus on damaging the Ark, since Grimlock didn't leave anyone to guard it, as well as recover all the captured Decepticons from the battle I mentioned they had last time with Omega Supreme. All helpfully labeled in boxes. This is the worst toy packaging I've ever seen. Grimlock and Blaster, upon spotting the battle from afar, realize that their struggle with one another helped the Decepticons launch this attack. Even Grimlock is forced to admit that for someone who's supposed to be the leader of all the Autobots, he's done a piss-poor job leading. As such, they agree that the battle ends in a draw and go to fight the Decepticons. In the meantime, Goldbug heads to Fort Max's ship, the Steelhaven, and instructs the team left on guard duty that they have to take off per Fort Max's orders. Their ship is no match for the Decepticons, and safeguarding Optimus Prime's brain takes priority. They force the Decepticons into retreat, but the Ark is severely damaged. Unless they can repair it, they'll all run out of power on the moon. Fort Max explains that he sent his ship to the one place where they might all gain back the leader they need with the resources necessary to rebuild Prime. Nebulos, where the Headmaster's stuff all started. It's the only place left in the universe where Optimus Prime can be upgraded from five and a quarter inch to three and a half inch. Goldbug and his team arrive on Nebulos in issue 42, and unfortunately, things are not great. They're directed to Hi-Q, a scientist who has the capabilities to build Optimus a new body, and gives them the rundown of what happened. After the Autobots and Decepticons left, he and his partner, Hi-Test, were given the task of devising a way to prevent Transformers from ever returning to Nebulos. They saturated the atmosphere with a unique radiation that tainted any fuel sources that could be used by Cybertronians. The radiation posed no threat to humans. Two Decepticons Decepticons arrived on Nebulos looking for Scorponok and his forces, and, when the Nebulans refused to explain where they had gone, they stuck around and ingested some of the fuel sources. However, High Test, jealous of Hi-Q for coming up with the solution, stole some of Hi-Q's research on the Power Master process, wherein, like the Headmaster's idea, humans are converted into cybernetic enhancements to bond to Transformers. However, instead of becoming their heads, well... In order to change a human being, into this. Okay, hi Q, if you were the good guy, why were you doing research on how to turn human beings into batteries? The downside of the Power Master process is that the humans now need to eat at least 10 times as much food as they had done before for fuel, and yet weirdly they have to poop 30 times more than a normal human. After the Autobots risk themselves to try to stop the two Power Masters, Hi-Q and his science team agree to rebuild Optimus's body. Mind you, he still thinks this is all a game. But only briefly. He's been upgraded to combine with his trailer unit to be more powerful, and when he starts to die from lack of energy, his memories and realization of his existence return. Hi-Q, impressed that the Autobots are as alive as any person, agree to become Optimus's Power Master unit to save him. The other scientists, save for one, also decide to become Power Masters to save the others, except for Goldbug, who's more fuel efficient than the others, and thus doesn't need it. They force the two to leave, but Hi-Q and his team have to leave as well. The Power Master process 
process created fundamental changes to them that they can't survive without the human component. And the Autobots can't stay because the entire point of this whole thing was to keep Transformers off of Nebulos. It's really kind of interesting just how much we've deviated from the animated series at this point. We're about six months past the end of the cartoon with our next issue, and we are nowhere near anything like it. So in issue 43, the Quintessons use subliminal messages and TV transmissions to convince the Junkions to hate other lifeforms, leading to an eventual confrontation between Rodimus Prime and Galvatron on their homeworld. Yeah, issue 43 was a fill-in issue, where the regular creative team is running behind schedule for whatever reason, and they need to release something for the month. Often, DC and Marvel used to have what were called inventory stories. Basically, commission a comic issue that you don't actually intend to release unless you need it as a backup. They're done-in-ones, usually made by a different creative team, as shown here, as Buddy Ansky did not write this one, and sometimes will interrupt a major storyline. Whether this was an inventory story or not, I couldn't say, but I suspect it was. This issue is an adaptation of The Big Broadcast of 2006, a season three episode of the show. I have no idea why this episode episode in particular was chosen, but it's likely just for convenience sake. That maybe this was made in 1986 when the episode aired, and maybe they thought the comic would eventually be heading in the direction of the movie and TV series. Instead, this is just a saga from the future. If you can call a story where most of it is the Junkions making random pop culture references while every other faction out there is just confused about what's going on, a saga... But yeah, let's just move on to issue 44. On their way back to the moon, our heroes receive an intergalactic advertisement for a cosmic carnival. The greatest show in the galaxy! Oh criminy, the gods of Ragnarok are at it again! Yes, Transformers is canon to Doctor Who as well, thanks to Death's Head over in the UK issues. Screw the Tommy Westfall universe, Marvel holds connections to like 99% of pop culture in one way or another. Naturally, they want to ignore this whole thing and get back to the moon, but then in the promotional images, they see Skylinks, whom they had last seen protecting those kids from the Dinobots. Earlier dialogue had said they had flown off after Blaster surrendered. Admittedly, I would have gone off to go help the Autobots first, time crunch and all. Plus, you could get back up, but whatever. Long story short, before the kids were flown back to Earth, they saw the ad for the circus and wanted to check it out. But they entered without paying. Skylinks was forced to sign a contract to perform, the kids do, until they'd paid off their debt. Our heroes rescue them, with Optimus even joining in on the act with Skylinks. People waited almost two years for Optimus Prime to come back, and what is the first thing he does? Join the circus. I kid, of course. In the process of escaping, they basically destroy the other acts under the big top. Huh, what are other crowds reacting to all this when this wasn't what they paid to see? You know, I could get quite cross about this. Issue 45's mostly a done-in-one, with the only major ongoing story developments show Skylinks finally returning to Earth with the kids so they can be reunited with their parents. Interestingly, he actually contacted Earth ahead of time, and they even have a brief interview before a crowd of people protesting the Transformers forces him to leave. The issue instead focuses on one of the Decepticon pretenders, Skullgrin, who was sent by Scorponok to set up a secret fuel depot. As a Decepticon pretender, your outer shell hides your robotic form. Perhaps you'll arouse less suspicion that way. Yep, nothing suspicious about a 20-foot tall monster whose head looks like a cow skull. I'm starting to think Zarek's presence as Scorponok's head slowly drained his intelligence. He ends up being found by a sci-fi movie producer who recruits him as the monster for his next film. But the whole thing ends up in flames when Circuit Breaker, suspecting he's actually a Transformer, attacks. I'd say this is further evidence of why the Pretenders concept just doesn't work, but honestly, with Circuit Breaker, she probably suspects that trees are secretly in league with robots whenever they don't provide enough shade. To continue our trend of focusing on the bad guys, probably due to Hasbro wanting to showcase more toys, issue 46 is another done-in-one, this time featuring something of a Scheme of the Week by Scorponok. He sets up a fake anti-Transformers foundation and enlists human bounty hunters to track down Autobots using a jammer technology that will inhibit a Transformer's ability to, well, transform. With the aid of some Autobots, the bounty hunters defeat Scorponok and plan to sell the Jammer technology to humans, but this is never followed up on. Issue 47 instead begins another plot of the week, but it's more than that. It's the first part of the four-issue Underbase saga. The Decepticons advertise Club Con, a tropical vacation resort that features the Decepticons acting as servants for humans. Your journey to paradise begins the moment one of our expert travel agents arrives at your doorstep. 
Hi, I'm Starscream! Fly me! These vacationers have spent all their money! I, Starscream, am now on vacation! The Autobots have reunited and the Ark repaired, now orbiting Earth. What gets them to finally become involved is that Buster is also part of the commercial, shown as the king of the island. It's gonna turn out this has been Buster's long con the whole time, convincing Ratbat it's more fuel efficient and profitable to just run a vacation resort instead of trying to get energy for Cybertron. Blaster is intended to be sent in with Sparkplug to infiltrate the island. While Sparkplug still wants nothing to do with the Transformers after everything that's happened, he saw Buster in the ad and will do anything to get him back. However, Buster's girlfriend Jessie decided to go instead, saying that she should be the one to do it since the resort is advertised to young people and Sparkplug would be suspicious. Old people don't take vacations? What the hell are you talking about? Look, the reality is that the teenage boys who read this comic are desperate for some fan service and I'm gonna give it to them. The Hell you are! I didn't buy a new bikini just so I'd be upstaged by you and yours! The two eventually discover an underwater base, as well as Buster held as a prisoner. He explains that hundreds of years ago, some Autobots on Cybertron detected something approaching Earth. They knew about Optimus and company crashing on the planet four million years ago and sent two microcassettes, Rain Dance and Grand Slam, to warn Optimus about whatever it was that was approaching. Okay, I should be questioning why, if they knew Optimus was here this whole time, they didn't just dispatch people to come get him and the others, but I just love the acknowledgement of Rain Dance and Grand Slam. They're microcassettes that turn into a jet and a tank, and as you may have noticed, I'm all about the micro cassettes. The ship malfunctioned as it entered Earth's atmosphere and it crash landed, the two cassettes wounded and disabled, sinking into the bottom of the ocean. The Decepticons have finally tracked them down and are searching for them. Ratbat set up the island as a sovereign nation, then started the vacation resort thing as a cover for their search for the shipwreck. The Decepts keep me around as the figurehead king. They figured correctly that with a human ruler, no other country could legally interfere with their search. I was also going to point out that this whole thing is patently ridiculous on so many levels, but apparently the forming their own island nation thing does kind of have precedence with the Principality of Sealand. Look it up. It still shouldn't stop the humans from wondering what the hell they're up to and investigate regardless of the claim of their independence, but still, A for effort on this plan and the logistics of it. Jesse and Blaster can't free Buster just yet, but they do escape to inform the Autobots of what's up. Issue 48 continues the Underbase Saga, and is one of a few issues featuring Soundwave without his mouth plate. Soundwave making new changes in his life. You could even call me New Soundwave. Examining the tapes, the Decepticons discover what the deal is. Within each Transformer is a database, the sum total of all their knowledge and wisdom. Millions of years ago, there was a database of databases, the combined knowledge of all Transformers. This is the Underbase, and the sum totality of that information and knowledge contained in any one Transformer Transformer would be devastating. All that knowledge could make a Transformer more than what they are. Expansion of consciousness, limitless energy, etc. Who knew that Wikipedia would be the deadliest weapon of all? As per my joke, information is not capable of doing anything like that, but I would imagine it's more akin to how in the Stargate franchise, some races have been able to ascend to a higher plane of existence or change into pure energy by accumulating enough knowledge. It's less to do with the information itself, but rather the kind of things it can convey are concepts so advanced that it can physically alter you, probably on an instinctual and subconscious level. Your body chemistry, or in this case, mechanics, alters to contain all that information, and the only way to do so is to become... well, you get the idea. It's worse than that, though, since even the storage medium of the Underbase is transformed by its existence, giving off enough energy that could destroy stars and planets. And the two microcassettes wanted to inform Optimus Prime that the Underbase would be approaching Earth's solar system. Well, that it would be approaching Earth in, like, 200 years, but still, it's good to start planning early. The Decepticons have charted the course and determined that it'll be in the solar system in less than a week. Issue 49 brings Scorponox forces to meet with Ratbats. Starscream invited them since they saw the commercials advertising their beach resort. And let's face it, the Decepticon headmasters have had a bit of a rough time too. They could use a vacation. After Blaster discovered their operations, they ended the resort and moved to the Arctic. Starscream also didn't tell Ratbat about Scorponox communiques until they arrived. Soon, after giving a tour to Scorponox forces of their base, they see Buster, 
Who lets slip about the underbase? Aggravated that he wasn't informed about this, Scorponok decides they'll find no help or camaraderie from Ratbat's forces and decides to leave. Unfortunately, this was Starscream's plan all along, as Ratbat refuses to let them leave now that they know about the underbase, and the two sides begin to fight. Starscream then takes Buster and leaves him on an iceberg two miles away with a signal device for the Autobots to come rescue him. With him that close, the Decepticons will unite and fight the Autobots, and then both factions will be distracted fighting each other while he goes and takes the power of the Underbase. And indeed, he steals Scorponok's ship, the two Decepticon leaders realizing his treachery, bringing us into issue 50 and the conclusion of the Underbase saga. And you gotta give the dude credit, he's been back online for only a short time, and already his treachery has nabbed him access to that kind of power. With skills like that, maybe Starscream should have been leader of the Decepticons, and Megatron was holding him back. Issue 50's cover is another one of those classics I mentioned last time. This uber-powerful, over-detailed Starscream standing tall and triumphant around some Transformers under his sway. I'm especially fond of all the detailing on him. Back in the days when I did some 3D modeling, this was called Greeble. It's actually something that lines up with comic art. As a general rule, the more lines on someone's face give the impression of more age, and just like that, Greeble gives the impression of something much more complex and not just you know, random lines and circles all over him. I mean, after all, do you think Jose Delbo, the artist, actually figured out what those three circles on Starscream's right leg do? Anyway, issue 50 is an oversized comic, 38 pages instead of the regular 22. The Autobots rescue Buster while the Decepticons prepare to leave, ready to put aside their differences to focus on the real threat from Starscream. However, the presence of so many Autobots distracts them and, like morons, they attack. Even Skullgrin is with them for this. Yeah, his movie career stalled after he said some racist things about the Combaticons. Don't worry, dude. Knowing how Hollywood works, you'll somehow be forgiven for all that in a few years, despite no attempts to make amends. Meanwhile, Starscream approaches the Underbase. Yes, I can imagine how that fleshling, Buster Witwicky, used the device I gave him to save his puny life, calling his deluded do-gooder Autobot friends to their doom, unaware as they must have been that the Decepticons' main base was only a short distance away. And now, happily, the two sides no doubt slaughter each other, because no one had the will, the guile, the vision to do what I I am about to do! And man, I really need some troops to command! Monologuing to yourself isn't really quite as satisfying. Buster, recovered enough from the cold, informs Fort Max and Ratbat about Starscream's plan to deceive them all. And so the two sides finally declare a ceasefire and join forces. Optimus points out the folly of anyone going after it. I learned then that its power is too great for anyone being too, typo, possess. Mere possession brings madness. Or death. Or death, then madness. The Transformers all ready the Decepticon base and launch it, but they're too late. Starscream has already reached the underbase. Blind me with your awful light! Thrill me with your darkest secret! Starscream immediately regrets his decision when the underbase begins listing off increasingly bizarre fetishes, which starts off with window curtains and keeps getting weirder from there. Fill me with your unholy power! Give yourself to me! Oops, sorry Starscream, but you've reached your limit of unholy power for today. But if you pay this microtransaction, you'll get an additional 50 unholy power. Fortunately, the Transformers soon arrive and shoot Starscream, blasting him away from the underbase. However, even that brief exposure was enough to empower him, and he blows the flying island apart and sends everyone hurtling through space. Starscream says he'll let them drift throughout eternity as punishment for attacking him. Ironic punishment given what happened to Starscream in Season 3. He leaves to go conquer the Earth, specifically stating that he'll make the humans obey him by destroying New York, Tokyo, and Buenos Aires. Not sure why he specifically felt the need to point out which cities he'd destroy, as if that mattered to either side, but hey, again, Starscream just needs an audience. Optimus fortunately anticipated this possibility and made sure the Ark would be nearby to come save them. Although this does raise the question of why they wasted time prepping the Decepticon Island rocket if they could have just taken the Ark. They elect to split into teams, each one led by an Autobot and Decepticon, to intercept Starscream at the three cities. Optimus remaining behind on the Ark to safeguard Buster and enact another plan, though the Decepticons think he's just being cowardly. And this leads to... well... 
a slaughter. Buddy Anski's time in the book was coming to a close, and he realized that the Underbase Saga needed a big finale to justify the hype. In addition, with Hasbro continually requesting new characters be added to push the toys, he then realized in turn that Hasbro wouldn't give a crap if he killed off the characters who didn't have any new toys. As such, a lot of Transformers get killed here. Ones that had focus on them, like Blaster, others who were introduced and then barely did anything, like Jetfire or the Triple Changers. Just a lot of clearing the deck. The good news is that, in Buddy Ansky's view, killing off robots isn't really the same thing as killing off a human, since robots can be rebuilt and restored, and it does happen to some, like the Dinobots, all killed in this issue, but all restored later. It's just in some cases, like the Technobots, or the Predacons, or Thundercracker, we don't see them come back. We do, however, see Soundwave return after his death, because... Well... Soundwave Superior. The ones who directly survive are the ones who have an organic component. The Headmasters, the Pretenders, etc. The Underbase's power seems to have trouble with more organic life. Even Omega Supreme, who was the one who took down Starscream 31 issues ago, gets blasted and taken out. Buster makes a transmission to Fortress Maximus and informs him that Optimus is working on something. Starscream, overhearing, decides to go and deal with Optimus before he can launch his plan. Ratbat and Scorponok try to stop Optimus as well, thinking he's trying to steal the Underbase for himself, but in reality, he's redirecting it right at Earth. Scorponok kills Ratbat and tries to take the Underbase's power, but Optimus stops him. Instead, Starscream arrives and absorbs the rest of the Underbase. However, as Optimus said, even mere possession of it brought madness or death, so in this case, Starscream's absorption of the remaining power overloads him, and he blows up. The call from Buster was a deliberate ploy to bring him up. Prime and Scorponok depart to tend to their wounded and dead, ending the Underbase Saga. And it's a great one. It builds up the size and intensity as it goes on, starting as just a weird Decepticon scheme of the week, and ending on a threat that required both sides, around 80 or so Transformers, to unite to try to take it out. The body count is unfortunate, but understandable, especially when it comes to clearing the deck and letting the focus shift back to a few primary characters. And it truly established the threat that Starscream posed. Admittedly, there's kind of a plot hole here with why they didn't just let Starscream absorb the full power of the Underbase at the start if this was inevitable, but I suppose Optimus couldn't risk him realizing the danger of that and just getting a little bit of it, since even that small portion he got was decimating. 